Some of you have a, an opportunity to be here tonight, <clears throat> and I'm really, really excited about this series. If you do not have a worksheet and would like to participate in taking notes tonight, please raise your hand, and our guys are coming around with the extra worksheets. We have a few. Fantastic. If you're watching live via the internet, go to the top of the screen and click the little red icon button that says notes and <laughs> series notes. You can click that and it'll take you to another page and you'll actually see the very notes that we're going to be discussing tonight. You can follow along on a separate window there as well. Amazing. I just thank God for his presence, don't you? I love being in the presence of God. I love worshiping the Lord. It doesn't matter how heavy hearted you are when you come into this place. It doesn't matter what you're carrying on your shoulders. It's like where two or three are gathered in his name and you've got the will to be in the presence of God and you ask and you seek and you literally are knocking and pounding on the door of heaven. God is here and he's meeting needs. So would you just kind of go to prayer with me right now and let's just ask God to continue to meet those needs and continue to open our hearts to his word. Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be in your presence. God, I thank you that where your presence is, there's fullness of joy. It's, there's not a lot of joy outside the doors of a church necessarily in this world because there's a lot of things drawing from us, especially during this season. Everyone and everybody, everything is, is trying to attach themselves to us as individuals and get something from us. And God, what we're saying is, Lord, you get to have everything. And then from that relationship, you just show us, point us in the direction that we can just begin to funnel that love and touch others around us. God, I pray that you would begin to speak to us even with, with greater clarity tonight as we go into your word, as we discover the person of the Holy Spirit, your spirit in our life. This is an incredible teaching. It's, it's, it's transformed my life on many, many occasions. And God, I pray the same for those that are here and watching. We love you. We ask that you would take absolute control of the service. Our thoughts, our intentions, everything about this service is yours. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said it with me, amen? Amen. amen. I started a series, I've entitled it Foundations, and it's something that a lot of people go, I don't want to listen to that much, but it's doctrine. How many know what the definition of doctrine is? Everyone that has been here for more than a week needs to raise your hand and say, I know exactly what that is. It's teaching. You know, whether it's a true, uh, whether it's a, 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 a true doctrine or a false doctrine, teaching is doctrine, period. So we need to know that whenever there's teaching happening, it is entitled doctrine. And of course, the doctrine that we teach is right here, cover to cover, this is the Word of God. We don't veer from this, we're not going to put opinions in there, although I will highlight various thoughts and schools of thoughts tonight, because it's a teaching and you need to have uh, awareness of, of other things, how people say things, how, how they form their phrases and so forth, other denominations, other thoughts and schools, but there's only one school of thought here, and that's authored and inspired, and that's a word we've learned through this series, God breathed, inspired by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. I started the series, this particular portion of the series, discussing the person, the necessity, and the benefits of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is in fact a person. He can be grieved. He has a will. He has a mind. He, he has the ability to connect us to the mind and will of the Father. And who knows the thoughts and the intentions of a man other than the spirit of the man, other than the internal, the mind, the thought, the will, the emotion. And we know that the Holy Spirit represents fully who God is. I taught you that there is a general will of God and a specific will of God. What's the general will of God for your life? Right here. You can find out if you need to kill somebody or not. Right here. You know, if you had a bad driving day today and you really want to know, should you go back and confront and, and, and inflict harm on that person? Go into the Word, and He'll give you His general will. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not, you know, all those wonderful shalt nots. And if you want to know the specific will of God, He has that too. Like, who should I marry? What job should I take? Where should I go? And when? Those are things that you can actually learn from God, because God speaks. You know that, right? He has a voice. He allows His Holy Spirit. You know, the Word of God, according to Psalms and according to other places here, this is the lamp unto your feet and the light into your path. But you have to live day to day, and you're going to think, you know, things will come into your mind and into your heart, and you're going to have to say things to get through your day if you want to know what to say, where to go, and how to do it. Ask God. He has a specific will for your life, and that will be authored through the Holy Spirit. 
Let me give a quick shout out. I hope my friend Mark is watching right now. I mentioned Mark Allen to you guys a couple of weeks back, and he was unable to watch, but he's helping us try to get our streaming intact, the levels and all of that, and I, I respect his opinion. I hope he's watching. I'm saying hello to my friend Mark. All right, shameless plug for my buddy. Last week, I, 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 no, two weeks ago, I talked about the three celebrations that God mentions in the Bible, the, the, the Feast of Passover, the, the Feast of Pentecost, and the, the Feast of Tabernacle. And we went into that because you need to understand how that correlates with the Holy Spirit and the necessity of the Holy Spirit and how God integrated that into our lives. The Passover, obviously, a beautiful conclusion to that week was that Jesus has fully satisfied the Passover. You know, through the blood of the Lamb, we are saved. The original Passover in Egypt, it was the blood of the lamb over the doorpost that saved the family. You have the very same gift of God through Jesus, the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, over your life. If you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, he is your Passover lamb. And that has been made fully through Jesus. And we also know that according to Acts chapter 2, Pentecost has been fully uh, known to us as well. The original Pentecost, we went back into the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, and we learned how that first day of Pentecost, God speaking to Moses on the mountain, you know, the cloud and everything happening, except there were 3,000 people that lost their lives that day. We talked about that. However, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit had come, the promised Holy Spirit from God, when Jesus says, I'm no longer going to be able to be with you, but there's much, much more I need to communicate. There's so much more I want you to learn. There's so much more I need to, to be a part of your life through. So as I go, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, Pentecost had fully come in an instant. And 3,000 people that day got saved. You'll read that in the scripture. So it's a powerful turnaround to that. And of course, we talked about tabernacle. Uh, we answered the question, does the Holy Spirit baptize? Yes or no? Fantastic. Yes, he does. And we know that we're on firm scriptural foundation when we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Last week, I let uh, Pastor Dan, he, he came and he addressed you guys, those of you who were able to attend, and he talked about the difference. And there is one in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful message of truth, and we're going to expand on that tonight. So let me ask you a question. This is what we'd like to answer. Does the Holy Spirit speak in tongues? <laughs> this is something that, of course, it's widely accepted in our fellowship. We're the Assemblies of God, and we, we ask God for the fullness of his gifts. We're going to learn what that word means. We're going to expand on that through the Scripture, and I hope that you'll leave tonight with a better understanding of the Holy Spirit and the idea of tongues. And so that, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you'll put your hand there, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 will be a primary source of our scripture. Of course, there's a whole bunch more scripture. You'll be following along in your notes as well. I've provided those. Also, Ephesians chapter 6. So the first thing in your notes that I want you to be addressing is this. The grace of tongues, okay, notice I said grace, and the gift of tongues, why would I say grace? Charisma. If you've ever heard that word as a definition of, uh, of tongues in the Holy Spirit, charisma means grace gift. Every gift is a grace gift. Why is that? Grace gift is in your notes. Write that down. Charisma is grace gift. Every gift is a grace gift because we have not earned that gift. You know, every gift that God gives you is not earned on your part. If you thought that coming in, I'm sorry, I've popped your bubble. You can't earn the grace of God. That is a gift of God through Jesus in your life. And through Jesus in your life, then the Holy Spirit in your life. This is a grace gift. However, I want I wanna you to write this in your notes too, because this is very critical in understanding grace versus mercy. You know you've heard those two words before. The grace of God and the mercy of God. And the way I like to define that, it's very simple is this, the grace of, or the mercy of God is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, grace is receiving what you do not deserve. A grace gift is receiving from God what you do not deserve. You didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, you can't buy it, can't purchase it, can't work for it, whatever. A grace gift. Grace is receiving what you do not deserve. Mercy is like when you cry out to God, God have mercy on me, don't give me what I deserve. It's not receiving what you deserve. Did you catch that? Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. 
So the mercy of God is bestowed upon us through the grace of God. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there is a private grace. Again, that's the private gift of tongues. There's a private grace. Every believer can pray in tongues. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an illustration here in a couple of minutes of a mainline denominational pastor that you would, when you hear, you know, the, the denomination he's in, you're like, whoa, big Big red light. He can't speak in tongues. He can't have that gift because that, they don't teach it. They don't believe it. They don't, they don't endorse that. He would lose his job. He'd lose his congregation. He would lose the opportunity to share the gospel. And I'm going to show you how even in, in different denominations, God touches who he wants to. And when that experience happens, you can't deny it. You just can't deny it. And it's not something you make up. And that's, that's what I want you to understand about this. There's a private grace and there is a public gift. The private grace is for everybody. Every one of you in here should and openly receive this gift of grace in your life. You should have a prayer language that doesn't require interpretation. Does that make sense? You, 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 just because you pray in, in the Spirit doesn't mean it has to be interpreted because we'll see the Scriptures say that is something between you and God that the Holy Spirit is in charge of. But there is also a public gift of tongues, and that does need an interpretation. Where did the phrase, the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit come from? A long time ago, 1904, there was a Welsh revival over the pond, as they say, and it began to spawn this amazing, powerful move of the Holy Spirit. The, God began to pour into these folks, and a couple of years later, here in America, at Azusa Street, many of you know that name, in Los Angeles, the street still is, is there, and it's... This is where another revival was spawned. People began to pray for the Holy Spirit, began to pray for revival, and the Holy Spirit responded to them. And while God was responding through his Holy Spirit, many of them were being baptized in the Holy Spirit during that time. There was a guy named William Seymour. If, you're, if you've been a part of the Assemblies of God, you know that's a huge name because a lot of, of our doctrinal background, the teachings, the background of, of, of everything that we you know, stand for came and was birthed through this. And this man said the initial experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit was the same as what is mentioned in Acts, when the Holy Spirit fell on those that were waiting and tarrying, ter tarrying, if, that's a, if I could say that. They were waiting on the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, you go to that place and you wait for the promised Holy Spirit, okay? In that initial experience, that's what he's speaking of. You just need to know this. Every revival... In every revival, it doesn't matter where it is. I've watched them kind of pop up. I've watched them kind of go away. There's always going to be ridicule, and there's always going to be uh, misunderstandings. But there were a lot of denominational lines crossed when the Holy Spirit began to move at Azusa Street. It didn't matter what denomination you came from. If there was a hunger and a thirst for more of God through what is called righteousness, these people began to show up from all kinds of denominations and they began to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. That initial physical evidence, what initially happened physically, when that happened, they began to speak in tongues. And that's where the phrase came from. And as a result, many of them were kicked out of their denomination. They didn't have a denomination to go back to because it was something that was misunderstood, perhaps. It was something that was ridiculed. Maybe it was shown because there was a lack of knowledge there. Whatever the case, it doesn't matter. We can't point fingers and say they were wrong. All you can know is the truth of it is that they were not welcomed back into their denominations. And through the years, it's become somewhat of a debate and often a pressure thing. We know here, we... We've asked God for the fullness of his gifts to operate in our services, and more importantly, in our life, period. It's not that we come to one place and say, God, would you move in a specific gift? We say, God, move in our life however you want, whenever you want, in all of the gifts. I'm not going to be the guy that pushes away a gift from God. Are you? No way. And the Holy Spirit is God. So why would we push away anything the Holy Spirit represents? You're pushing away God when you do that according to the Scripture. This is doctrine, the teachings of God through the Word of God. Right here, okay? So having that in mind, and, and there's been guys quoted, and I, I put this in because you need to have a perspective. You may have felt this. Uh, sometimes it's as if tongues has become more of a demand rather than a desire. If you felt that way here, I need to diffuse that. You need to understand from your pastor Speaking in tongues is not a demand from me. I can't give it to you, okay? But it's something I desire for you. 
I desire for you to hunger and thirst for a righteousness not of your own. And when you catch a hold of Christ through the blood, he's the lamb, and the promise of the Holy Spirit comes into your life, God just has control. And he can begin to flow through you in measures you've never experienced. He begins to author gifts in your life. We're going to talk next week specifically about some of those gifts and how those gifts operate. But tonight specifically, it's, it's just in this one area. If you go to our website and you're interested in kind of the core belief and you're interested in some of the supporting scripture behind that, um, I kind of wrote down the pathway here. If you go to the main website, uh, lifeatfaith.tv, and you hit About Us, it'll come down and you'll see a Frequently Asked uh, Question button. If you hit that, it'll shoot you right across to Beliefs. You hit that and there's 16 fundamental truths that the Assemblies of God has published, okay? It's, that in and of itself is not sovereign. This is sovereign. But those are powerful fundamental truths that we believe if we stick, and, and stick to, God will bless us because every one of those is Scripture, all right? So number eight on that list is this, the initial physical evidence. I want you to write evidence down in your notes. The initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'll read it to you. The baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. The speaking in tongues in this instance is the same, uh, is the same in essence as the gift of tongues mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you can read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit there, and that's mentioned there. So the first thing that I want us to expand on is this. It's scriptural to speak in tongues. Remember, I started the series with this, the Holy Spirit is not weird. People often are, and that's okay. God loves us. He loved us enough to give us his best. So I'm not not saying, okay, the people around you are weird. I'm just saying, if you've had an experience that your heart was just wrenched with, I want you to ask God to take that experience out of your heart And for the next few moments, let him pour into you his scripture to ease you of that. If you grew up in a place that the Holy Spirit, the mention of the Holy Spirit by name, and the gifts, the power, and the representation through the scripture of the Holy Spirit was not something acceptable, I want you to ask God in his grace to lift that out of your heart and allow him to speak to you just through his scripture for the next few minutes. If you were exposed to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they were abused in any way, shape, or fashion and it confused you, it hurt you, you don't understand it, it was frustrating, I want you to ask God right now, in your grace, would you lift that experience from my heart for this moment and let your scripture, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, speak to me for the next few minutes. And in the next few minutes, my prayer for you is this, that God would guide you into all truth through his Holy Spirit. And this is for you. Okay, this is so that the Holy Spirit can just begin to comfort you through his word. And with this, you'll have a doctrine through the scripture to just kind of settle yourself in and begin to expand your knowledge and your heart and your understanding in. Paul will kind of lead us through some of this. What is Paul speaking about when he mentions tongues? According, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. When he mentions tongues, this particular instruction that Paul is giving He's giving it to a church, just like you and I, as if Paul had walked through those doors. We had been operating in what we believe are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and perhaps maybe we just, in our lack of knowledge or lack of experience, these types of things began to expand into more of a fleshly display, okay, or more of a lack of knowledge kind of thing, and we began to abuse. We didn't even really know what was going on. We were just being zealous in our faith. We were just being excited about this, and all of a sudden, we began to take on another form of what it should have been all along. Paul comes through the doors, and he begins to speak to the church, and he's wanting that church in Corinth to understand the difference in the public gift. Like I mentioned to you before, there is a public gift that requires an interpretation, and the private grace of tongues. It'll make better sense in just a second. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. It says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries within his spirit. So in your notes, the next thing I've written there, if you speak in tongues, you're literally, you are speaking in, write this down, the spirit. You know that God has created you in his image, right? 
which enables you to connect to God spiritually, which makes you different than the rest of creation. Your dog or your cat or your bird, as much as we love our animals, cannot do that. The trees, the heavenlies, whatever. Nothing can connect to God like you spiritually. So there is, a, there is a way for us to do that. And when you pray or speak in tongues, what you're doing is you're speaking in the Spirit. You're not speaking, according to the Scripture, to man. But you're speaking to God. Why? Because no one understands what you're saying. If you're speaking in tongues, you're doing that to God, for God, to God, through the Spirit. And that is a beautiful grace gift for the private and a beautiful public gift for us in the sanctuary and for God's people. All right, Paul was helping the church understand that the difference between the private gift and the public gift is, um, and he's making it, he's making, that's what he's focusing on, he's making it very clear right out of the box that if you're praying to someone or praying, not praying to someone, praying for someone or coming alongside someone and praying with them, he is saying to this church, please pray in a language that they understand what you're saying. Because if someone is lifting their hearts and, and, and opening their heart to the Lord and somebody comes up and begins to lay hands on them, they need to understand what's being said. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is a powerful truth of the scripture. Speak in an intelligible language unless there is a tongue corporately for interpretation. Now you may have seen it differently or experienced it differently. You can't condemn the person that that happened through. You don't know their story, and you don't know the moment. So I've told you, you got to take those experiences out of your heart right now and just let the Spirit speak to you through His Word, okay? And, and I'll make a little bit more sense and give you some examples of my life, how some of this has unfolded. 1 Corinthians, let's go to verse 14 through 16. Paul says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, okay? Uh, but my mind is unfruitful. In other words, if I'm praying in tongues, my heart is fully engaged. I'm plugged in to the heavenlies. I'm plugged into my spirit father, God himself. And I'm, I'm totally locked in. That is a powerful place to be. But my mind, according to him, is unfruitful. So what shall I do? He says, I'll pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you're praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he doesn't know what you're saying? So in other words, when I pray in a tongue, it's just hard to understand. Those around me, have you ever sat next to someone and they're praying in tongues and just, man, I wish I could understand what they're saying. That is awesome. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It's authentic. You can't deny the, the power of God on their life. You don't want to, but it's beautiful. I often want to just need an interpreter. <laughs> you know, it's, it's awesome. And sometimes I've asked you from the pulpit, guys, begin to pray in the Spirit right now because what, you'll find out I was asking you to do something specifically for you. The scripture will tell us what that is in just a second. Jude 120. Okay? When, when I ask you to do that, that's for you. And that's where we begin to build ourselves up and we begin to say, God, there's something powerful happening here. Let your spirit fill us. Let your spirit just overwhelm within us the presence of the Almighty God so we can be so in focus. And so attuned, in tune to what you have to say in our life. We don't want to miss a thing. And that's what we're asking you to do in that moment. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let's go to verse 17. It says, you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man's not edified. Who, who is edified when you speak in tongues? Through the Spirit, you're speaking to who? Okay, well, it's very interesting how this unfolds. What Paul is saying here is this, and this is in your notes. When folks come up to you and they ask you a question... All right, literally, when folks come up to you and they ask you a question, don't bust out in tongues over them. It's okay. I'm not, okay. Some of y'all are like, ah, and some of y'all are like, I do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. But this, this is what he's saying to the church in Corinth. And let's just kind of wrap our heart around it and let's ask God to speak to us through this. Um, why does he say that to these people? Again, they had taken it to a whole nother level, ladies and gentlemen. They had taken it to an abusive place. That's why Paul had to go in and he had to make this correction. Because no one was understanding what was going on. He says, give your answer in a language that can be in your notes, understood. If someone is, is, is needing that from God, God will give you what they need to say here. The Holy Spirit speaks. God speaks. And if you're in tune to that and God chooses you, 
then speak that by faith, believing. But he's saying, don't go up to them and just bust out in tongues over them. Um, he's teaching those in Corinth, uh, at the church at Corinth that there's a public gift which requires interpretation and there's a private grace that everyone can use any time. This is, this is funny. I'm, I'm talking about me. I was at college and I had to be very, very careful that I'd, I don't lead anyone to try to start thinking who might that professor be. But I had a professor in college uh, that really prayed in tongues a lot. And I was in class, and this was something that happened often. It was, it, was, it was like not even an elective specialization class. It was just a class that I had to have. And when the teacher w would begin to talk even about the syllabus or talk about the day or talk about whatever she had, he had, whatever it might have been a he or she for lunch, <laughs> it was like, and I'm going to say Shondai, if that's part of your love, uh, love language to God, I'm sorry. Because Shondai, woo! And then she just started doing them. We're, we're in this class, and I didn't know we were there. We go to prayer, and we're like, God, get us there so we can understand. And she would start saying another phrase or two, and they bust out in tongues. Everyone's looking around. I'm at a Bible college. I'm supposed to understand this. And they're teaching us, you know, the Scripture. And, you know, all that is, it's an over, I, I believe, and this has happened in my life more than once, when the power of God is on you, there's this overwhelming sense. And, you know, like Jeremiah says, it's like fire shut up in my bones. Some of y'all know that. that. You can't keep it in you. It just, boom, it, it's got to come out. You understand that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when that becomes the norm, listen to me very closely, when that becomes how you handle those around you that just don't maybe understand the Scripture as you understand, maybe they need an intelligible language spoken to them for the moment, and God knows that through, his script, through the Scripture and through the Holy Spirit, but because this is what you've become accustomed to and you just bust out all over them like that, it might not be the healthiest situation for the moment. Okay, and here's, we'll get into the scripture and understand that, but for my example, it, it was weird in, in class. We weren't talking about spiritual things, but it became spiritual real fast. We're like, oh, we need to be, that's all I can say about that. I got a good grade, so I prayed a lot. It worked out. Let's go back to verses 14 and 16. I'm going to highlight something. For if we pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And that's, that's how this works. It's, that's, that's how it's designed. So what shall I do? Paul says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you're praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who don't understand, that means who is uninformed. That means who is unsaved. Okay? Say amen. Amen. To your thanksgiving, since he doesn't know what you're saying. Okay. Well, you know, I get questions I used to more often. Maybe it's through the teaching, and maybe, again, it's God's grace and unmerited favor in certain ways. I haven't had as many lately. But many of you have inquired, why on Sunday mornings, perhaps? That's our large group. That's where the, the power of God's moving so much, and the Holy Spirit is, is just thriving in our lives and you've if you've been here on Sunday morning you understand what that is like and there's there's an overwhelming sense within us and some of you have the gift of tongues publicly and you're like chomping at the bit and all of a sudden it's ready and and then it's not and then at the end of service you're like well where was doesn't when God shows up isn't it in in that it can be but he also shows up through the blood of the Lamb when people are getting saved. And it's on a rare occasion I get to thank God for that people aren't getting saved, right? That is a rarity around here. It doesn't happen very often that, so, that we have a, a, an entire week go by that someone's not getting saved. So according to the scripture, maybe, let me just put it in this format. Don't you think if the Holy Spirit is in charge of authoring that gift and the Holy Spirit is in charge of giving you the utterance and connecting you spiritually to our Father through the Spirit, don't you think he knows when it is appropriate and when it's not appropriate for the public gift to be displayed and the private grace to be displayed? I believe that with all of my heart. You know, as a pastor, I pray for all of the gifts, all of the operation of the Holy Spirit through himself in our lives, no matter what. I welcome it. We stop and we ask him to speak to us because we believe and we felt in our heart there's somebody here that has the public gift and God's speaking to him. And we often wait and it often happens and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't mean we were right. It doesn't mean we were wrong. 
It just means we were open to whatever God wanted to do at the moment. We understand it's a gift, a grace gift we haven't earned, but often God chooses to use people like us to speak, okay? And so I want you to understand through the scripture, maybe, maybe, and I know in scripture it says when you, when you pray and you, you worship in the spirit that it's not going to be a detractant to those seeking God wholeheartedly, but you've got to understand not everyone's in this place seeking God wholeheartedly every single time we open the doors. But if the scripture says for those that are unsaved, uninformed in this matter, speak in a way they can understand, maybe God had a point. And maybe we shouldn't wrestle with that. Maybe we should just be open to that and sincere and just trust God. And know that your pastor is full of the Holy Spirit. I speak, I have my language and we, we do our thing, okay? My whole family, you as a family of believers, we know what our gifts and we know what God is doing through our life. We don't have to prove it. So let's let God do his thing. Don't be disappointed if you don't see a gift in operation. Sometimes a more powerful one is accomplished without you even knowing it. And we won't even know those things until we get to heaven. Not an excuse not to justify, but I'm asking God for the fullness of his grace in our life. Let's go on in scripture. We've got a lot more here I want to I share with you. You need to be here next week, Wednesday night. And you need to bring a friend because if you ever had a question about gifts, the Holy Spirit, it, whether or not he's charismatic or not, and if that's okay, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, details discerning uh, declarative gifts, dynamic gifts, discerning gifts, all the above. It'll be a great, great session. Now look, go back to verse 4 in chapter 14. He who speaks in tongue, in a tongue, I asked you this question a while ago, edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So in other words, and I have this in your notes, the word edify here means builds up, okay? So when you speak in tongues, when you exercise the grace gift in, pub, in, in, in private, or you, you exercise this public gift, you're building yourself up. But he who prophesies builds up the church. Paul was helping the church at Corinth. Again, this is a teaching. He was helping them understand the difference between the grace gift and the public gift. Okay, the grace gift being that individual gift that you have and the public gift. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, it mentions this word prayer. And this is where you're putting on the full armor of Christ, full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy, the evil one, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and what? Pray in or with what? The Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and all kinds, literally, of requests. You know, how many, I wonder how many of you have not been encouraged to pray in the Spirit always with all kinds of prayers and with all kinds of requests. Just look inside your own heart right now and hear me say this. Pray, pray, pray in the Spirit, with the Spirit on all occasions. Don't stop. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the baptism, and that's a God thing. But you have the ability to begin to pray always on all occasions. And this is how the full armor of God begins to come into effect. I wonder how many people don't because they just haven't been told to. Well, you're informed. This is a foundation's teaching. You're informed. This is going to be good. It's a benefit because it builds you up. The Holy Spirit is a benefit in your life because what? It builds you up. Jude one twenty. Build yourself up in what? The most holy faith. And do what? Pray in the Spirit. That's why I said Jude one twenty before. It edifies you. Who, the Holy Spirit, what does He come to do? He comes to convince and to convict. To convince the righteous of what? You're right standing in God. No one else is going to tell you that you've made it, that you're okay, that you're more than a conqueror through Christ, that the blood of the Lamb is more than sufficient, that His grace, His power, and all is for you. The world's not going to tell you that, but the Holy Spirit will. All right? So pray in the Spirit. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. That's what the Scripture's telling you to do. And if you don't, how crazy is that? That's not smart. If God says, look, this is the one thing that will just get you going. 
This is the thing that will just like plugging you in to the power of God. This is the one thing that will enhance your witness. This is the one thing that will engage you into the things that matter most to God. When you're weary, when you're down, when you're destitute, and you're frustrated, build yourself up. And if you don't, why are you crying? Why are you frustrated? Who are you pointing your finger at? He diffuses that excuse. He disarms all of our excuses, doesn't he, by saying, look, just build yourself up. I've given you everything that you need to be successful in me. You just got to understand it and let this become a practice in your life. All right. I was, like, again, I told you I was in a wedding of a mainline uh, ministry, and it was not a Pentecostal. It was not a Slim of God. It wasn't a charismatic by any stretch of the imagination. This was a type of denomination that you don't talk about that side of the Holy Spirit. Okay? I was playing. It was one of those deals where I was doing a wedding, and, and he did part of the wedding, I did part of the wedding, and we were invited to play golf with the groomsmen and the, the, the groom or whatever that day, and it was kind of cool, and we started talking, we were riding the same cart, and he goes, you know, I really respect you. I, what? No, I respect your fellowship. It's better, better put that way. I go, okay, how is that? He goes, because while we were all getting our doctorates, because they cannot have a church until they have their doctorate degree, y'all were winning souls, and we, we had to stay in the books until we, you know, even though we felt the call to get out, we felt that nudge we, in, in order for us to have a congregation to minister to in this denomination, we, we had to stay on task. I was like, okay, wow. And he goes, no, no, I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm more impressed by your, your ability to exercise your gifts openly. He said, but I want to tell you a secret about me. I go, tell, 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 this is great, you know. I have been filled with the Holy Spirit too. And I was like, yeah, whatever, dude. No way. Really? Is that possible? He goes, yeah, and a lot of my buddies have too. But here's what I have, you have to know about us is that it literally is our closet language. And when we get there, God and his power infuses us. And you know why we stay in our denomination? I go, tell me. He said, because if we left, we're just a few that know the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. If we left, our congregation would not be led by the power of the Holy Spirit. I was dumbfounded. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit and the gift of grace that is offered through the Holy Spirit. It is a language for everybody. It doesn't matter what background you come from. God's no respecter of man. If you seek him and you hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. And I was just, that was a, an epiphany for me. That was the light bulb moment for me. That I could sit there with the guy that had to put on a robe and put on his, his stuff. And he had to say certain things, read certain things, and had to act a certain way in order to get through the process of his ceremony. But... I know now that ceremony was covered by the blood of the Lamb no matter what. He prayed over it, and he prayed in the Spirit for every single one of his congregates, and he goes to them and prays for them. Well, he may not be able to lay hands and believe in certain ways. Uh, he believes in certain ways, but he may not be able to lay hands and go beyond what their doctrine is. He said, but my thing is, I don't care how big my congregation is, he says, I am led by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I will stay as long as God will allow me because they need that. So I thought you should hear that. That was powerful. And you need to know that it's a choice. In, in verse 14 through 16, Paul says, if I pray in a tongue. And a lot of people through the years have taken that statement and said, well, he didn't say uh, uh, if the Holy Spirit comes on me and takes, well, and I'm sorry, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. If the Holy Spirit, if I pray in tongues, Paul said if. That doesn't mean maybe. It doesn't say that I did or I didn't. And it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit comes on me and takes over me, that I'm uncontrolled when I speak in tongues. In your notes, I want you to, to write this down. We yield to the Holy Spirit. We cooperate. We cooperate. We do this by faith. And why do you say that, Pastor? Because how do you pray? You pray by faith, don't you? I do. I don't always see God. I don't always feel God. Do you always? Do you always feel and know the tangible presence of God in your life all the time? Sometimes I pray by faith. Sometimes I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling and coming right back to me. But I pray anyways. I, I submit and I, I cooperate. 
in the teachings of God through the Scripture. I will pray always and continually have my mind set on things above. First things first. We'll talk about that in January. These are the things that capture our heart. I do this by faith. So this is in cooperation. This is, the, this is what I want you to understand. If in a few minutes we begin to pray, all right, and I'm going to ask all of you to pray, and I'm, we're not going to go around and lay our hands on you and say, begin to speak like me or, or speak in the Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. I want to cooperate. I want the Holy Spirit to blast you with his presence. I want you to be in a place of authenticity so that when you receive this gift, this grace gift for your private language, okay, I want you to be able to go back and say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's my experience. No one can take that away from me, all right? We're going to actually pray that in just a minute, but what I want you not to fear is that when you decide to come up here and we begin to pray together and the Holy Spirit fills you in such a measure that this week while you're at HEB, you're going to grab a hold of that intercom and go, attention please, Shandai! And you're going to go for it. I know, you're like, that's almost blasphemy. No, I'm making a point. I don't want you to fear this. I'm telling you, people fear this because they think they will be out of control. You cooperate, and you're not out of control. You cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Just like when you pray by faith, you begin to pray and you begin to build yourself up. You begin to speak, okay? Now, another thing that's not going to, I need it about, John, you have a big wallet, don't you? Get up here, buddy. I need an offering plate. We got an offering here. The Word of God will be our offering plate. We don't, yeah, that would be okay. No, I don't, <laughs> come here. I want you to give it to me. I want everybody to see. I don't need to see what's in it. Get up here. Put it in your pocket. When the offering came by tonight, okay, now they're making a point, the offering plate, and that offering plate went right by. Notice how your wallet didn't just jump out and go into the offering plate. It didn't come unhook your purse, open up the checkbook, and, go, and you're like, no, you're like, I can't do that. I don't want. No, you willingly gave by faith. Just like you willingly pray by faith. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, and I'm, you had a great example given right there. Your wallet stayed put. So I believe when you give, you give by faith. Thank you. All right, you don't have a special wallet. I'm looking for a special wallet. The kind that goes and pulls right on in. Anyways, we don't have those too much around here. All right, write this in your notes. If you're going to pray in the Spirit, which means in tongues, you're going to have to open your mouth. And I, I will tell you that that is, sometimes people fear, what is it going to sound like? How am I going to feel? Many of you have waited many, many years, and God has just kind of slowly pulled layer after layer after layer of self, maybe, inhibition, fear, whatever it was, and eventually got to that place. And you begin to open your mouth, and it just began to flow so naturally, and you're like, oh, it's one of those, why didn't I do this so long ago kind of things, you know? Because you kind of got to that place where God was leading you, but you cooperated, and it became a beautiful language that you began to communicate to God, and it was yours un. Deniably. Let me clear one more thing up. Go to Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 11. I know I'm, I'm carrying us into a few minutes over what we normally go, but this is very, very important because, again, with that fear, there's a school of thought out there, and maybe you thought this, that when you begin to pray in the Spirit, or you open yourself up, and what you do is you, you begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, that you're exposing yourself to demonic influence. Have you ever heard that school of thought or that teaching? That when you begin to speak in tongues, you're exposing yourself to demonic influence. May I remind you that tongues is a grace gift, charisma, that it is a gift from who? God. Now, if you'll go with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 19, this is what it says. It says, um, Jesus is basically saying, he replied, uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heavens. Uh, verse 19, he says, I have given you, those men in front of him, the authority to trample on, say it with me, snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of who? The enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, did it say take your socks off and roll your pants up and walk across a room full of rattlesnakes? You're an idiot if you do that, I'm sorry. But don't do, don't walk, don't do the fear factor thing and walk on, 
you know, uh, uh, those things bite. That's bad. He's not talking about snakes, and he's not talking about scorpions, although he says snakes, and he says scorpions. There are denominations and people, because we're weird, we do weird things, we'll put snakes, and we'll start handling snakes, because it says, I will trample snakes and walk on scorpions. Listen to me. God's not talking about that, okay? I called you an idiot, so if, if I find out you're, you're in the hospital because you did that, it's not my fault. Don't call pastor at 2 in the morning and say, I was handling a snake, I got bit. I would call you an idiot. Snakes are bad. Satan was a snake. Don't even mess with snakes. We're not talking about snakes. We're not talking about scorpions. Because look, if you go to chapter 11, this is where I'm getting to the point. Chapter 11, verse 11 says this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a what? A snake instead. Jesus was talking about the demonic. He was talking about those things that are influenced by the evil one. Okay? He's not talking about the physical snake and scorpion. He said, you'll trample on, what does it say here? Snakes and scorpions, and you will overcome all of what? The power of the enemy. So what's the power of the enemy? Where's that all bottled up? Well, how is that displayed? It's displayed through the demonic, right? It's displayed through, through uh, spiritual things. It's not flesh and blood like we think we wrestle with all the time. It's those other things. And God is saying through his son, you don't have to worry about that. As a matter of fact, verse 11, I'll continue reading here. Um, as a matter of fact, he says to the fathers, who, which of you uh, fathers, if, you, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake instead? Or, if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? He addresses those two things that I just told you real, just a minute ago. They're not manifestations of physical things. Those are spiritual things. If your son asks you for a good thing, are you going to give him a good thing? Or are you going to give him something that's going to bite him and kill him? You're going to give him a good thing. I'll answer it quickly because we're running out of time. So, and this is how he continues. He says, if then though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your Father in heaven give what? Say it loud. No. <laughs> How much more will your Father in heaven give thee? This. Say it loud. The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. When you ask for the Holy Spirit, I, I, I just showed you how the scripture just completely diffuses, and Jesus knew this, that's why he gave that, that teaching. He knows everything. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. Remember, he knows everything all the time. He's everywhere, every, everywhere at the same time. That's God. That's Jesus, right? So he knew there would be a school of thought that one day would challenge the whole snake and scorpion thing. So he said it, and he diffused it. And he says, if you're evil and know how to give good gifts, how much more does God, who is awesome, know how to give amazing gifts? Is not the Holy Spirit a gift of God? Are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit gifts from God? That's doctrine. That's the doctrine of this word, and that's what you need to wrap your heart around. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid of a manifestation. That's a weird word, but it's just a display outwardly of the Holy Spirit because every single one of you, you all are qualified for a grace gift. And that grace gift is your language. Every single one of you. So it doesn't matter what background you came from. It doesn't matter what your school of thought was. And I hope you honestly took what you had in your heart and you put it aside tonight so the Scripture could speak to you. The Holy Spirit loves you. Honestly, the Holy Spirit wants to love you more than you're capable of receiving that love. Just like Michelle said, her daughter doesn't matter. If her daughter wants her, nothing is going to stop that kid from getting to mama. And if you have kids, you understand that. And if you're a child of God, you should experience that for yourself. You just run and you just claw your way to the foot of the Father. And he holds heaven at bay just to hear your voice. Why? Because you're created beautifully and wonderfully and with his image. And you're special. And he wants to connect to you spiritually. Unlike how he connects to everything else in this creation. He actually has given you a song, and I say it often, I want someone to get it. The song of the redeemed. When you've accepted Jesus in your life, you begin to sing a song that those angels that were created to encircle the throne of God, that say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, and they've got this amazing, beautiful, just awesomeness, ain't got nothing on your song. When you begin to say, he saved me, he purchased me, 
He redeemed me, and I am now a child, purchased and blood-bought, different than everyone else, connected to God in his own image, and nothing can say anything of that. And the Holy Spirit is my best friend. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit, I need to know. The Holy Spirit, I need his gifts. I need him operating in my life first. And then I look corporately for that gift to be happening around me. That's, that's God. It starts with you. Will you stand with me tonight? I know I've, I've carried us a little bit further in our time frame, but this is what I, 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 I've envisioned this in my heart. I've prayed this, and I would really, really love 100% participation, so I'm, all, I'm setting you up, okay? If you desire the grace gift of the Holy Spirit, what is what? It's the private language. 